praise Cthulhu in this video sponsor Campfire Blaze. The world sucks right now. Let's escape into fantasy land. At least we can meet some new and exciting fantasy characters, or we would if fantasy authors ever decided to write any. And why would they? What's the point of building a character around a good solid core motive when instead we can create characters the much better way by slapping a broad archetype into the story and make absolutely zero modifications to them? So let's dig into some of the many kinds of fantasy characters we can write, starting with the farm boy. A writer can never go wrong with the classics, and one of the oldest classics is the farm boy of mysterious lineage. He longs for a life beyond being a farmhand and gets way more than he bargained for when his farm gets burned down, along with his peasant village, no matter how strategically insignificant it is. Now, the farm boy turned adventurer is not a completely outrageous concept. Life as a farmhand can build physical stamina, and they often make good stock for soldiers. But if you happen to be a wizard in need of hiding a lost heir, then don't worry. I can't think of any better place than a farm to learn the ins and outs of high stakes political intrigue and complex economic management skills needed to lead a kingdom. The Noble Hero A stark contrast with the farm boy, this character starts with a noble title and usually a prepackaged bundle of royal responsibilities complete with an unwanted arranged marriage. The noble hero, though, doesn't have to play catch up like the farmhand does since they already have the skills and resources needed to handle themselves. This means that I can skip the training montage. Know what else I can skip? All of the essential legwork on the culture and other world building details of the noble hero's house. That will all be replaced with endless whining about how hard it is to have all that pesky responsibility while the peasants just outside the castle walls starve and wish they had access to healthcare beyond leeches. The plucky young adult teen. Ah, the plucky YA teen who is being sent to, um, not warts, the magic school where only the most gifted and magically talented teens go. This character is so talented that they really don't need to go to school at all but they have to show off to someone. Besides, what better place to pick up a gaggle of suitors who constantly compete for the protagonist's attention? God forbid the writer actually make them freaking learn something at their stupid magical academy. The Average Modern Dude The Average Modern Dude is a protagonist with no discernible character traits other than being an empty vessel for the audience to project onto. This character is also from the modern world and would have normally been doomed to take part in a mediocre slice of life story with comedy elements, but thanks to the power of magical BS, that's short for basic summoning, or in anime speak, truck-coon, is transported to the magical world where the most magical thing they experience is that every attractive woman is fighting over them. Well, that, and also how he manages to somehow not die of dysentery in the first five minutes. How does their modern perspective clash with the ancient and alien culture and world they find themselves in. I don't know, here's a bunch of power fantasy. Isekai, I hear you scream in the comments, blissfully unaware of just how freaking old and worn out this trope really is, but don't you worry, Isekai is on my list as well. The Wizard. Now, I've already covered mentors, which wizards often fall into, but I thought I would also touch on the wizards themselves. You know, the standard issue one that everyone just rips off from Tolkien, who ripped off Odin, that comes from the writings of a monk who likely ripped off the Vikings, who probably also ripped off the Celts. So, just to reiterate, a wizard has a staff, pointy hat, long white beard, and robes. The wizard's magic should also never be as cool as anything the protagonist can do. The wizard should also be wise, but since writing wisdom is hard, a writer can settle for cryptic nonsense instead. Never ever just do the anything? Just do anything interesting with wizards. A character who wields powerful forces that redefine reality itself? No way that could shape a character's personality in an interesting and unique way. Better stick to the Tolkien standard issue knockoff Gandalf. If you really want to get creative, then just add burb poop to his head. The Plucky Thief. Need to round out the ensemble in a fantasy party? Just add a plucky thief. Thieves are great and always on the good guy's side. As they live a short-sighted, unsustainable, amoral, and very illegal lifestyles, it's only natural that they side with teen good guys and their insistence on doing things the hard but fair way. Why would a thief be tempted to join the side that takes moral shortcuts and values wealth and power over honor and fairness? 
Well, because our thief has a code of honor, no matter how crippling it is to their bottom line. Plucky thieves also make great comic relief characters that you can inflict on your audience. The mascot creature. Hey, listen to this suggestion about adding a small creature of some kind as a mascot, snarf. This great addition can serve as marketing, merchandising, and even as a dispenser of exposition and mission objectives. Will the audience fantasize about murdering the small annoying creature that never shuts up and talks in an irritating high-pitched voice? Of course not. Just make it cute and all sins will be forgiven. Give the mascot creature its very own character arc? Don't be silly, plush toys don't get character arcs. The protagonist's parents. Yeah, I'm sure they'll get loads of character development. Dead by chapter one if they're lucky. If not, then they probably got Disneyed in the backstory. The Good King. So, fantasy has this thing where it just loves monarchies, and it's every writer's duty to perpetuate that love unthinkingly. Monarchy is great. That's why there's so many of them still around. And many fantasy monarchies are led by the Good King. The Good King is good and cares about his subjects, even the poor, dirty, toothless ones. How does he navigate the maze of cutthroat court politics, nefarious overseas plots to undermine his rule, usurpers in his very family, pressure from powerful religious institutions, and still somehow manage to draft policies that don't have any major losers? Well, he uses whatever magic that instantly resolves all the plot's conflict whenever he is rightfully restored to the throne. Don't worry, I'm sure he will still be a good king even after he's an aged, sickly shell of a man who appoints his horse to the position of chief economic advisor. If the good king is on the throne and things are still bad, well, that's probably the fault of the scheming advisor. Remember that in fiction land, autocrats are always good, but experts are always bad. Why did the good king appoint Schemey von Neifenbach as his most trusted advisor? I mean, clearly the advisor's the problem, not the moron who appointed him and continues to trust him in spite of his astoundingly bad policy advice and aura of dark malevolent energy. Is it because of the advisor's charisma? His balding head, greasy hair, and constant outbursts of mad cackling say no. Is he using magic to alter the king's mind? Only if it's really obvious that he's doing so and has no backup plan if someone calls him out on it. Fortunately for him, someone as important as the king never has any bodyguards to notice such a thing. Getting rid of the scheming advisor is the best way to fix all of the kingdom's problems, no matter how endemic those problems are. The guards. The city guard is here. Not here to help though. Mostly they exist to get beat up by the good guys by rushing in and attacking them one at a time. And that's if they're lucky. The less lucky guards get eaten by the dragon or killed and zombified by the lich in order to establish how dangerous the bad guy is. And clearly the bad guy is very dangerous because he killed a bunch of guards who I established as weak and incompetent in the early chapters. Very scary. The guards only real job is jobbing, but they suck at that too apparently. Could I make the guards an actual competent faction in their own right and force both the heroes and villains to contend with them, turning a throwaway bunch of characters into a wild card faction? Of course, but I'm not going to waste my time with that when I have power fantasy to indulge in. The villain's right hand. Every bad guy needs an apex henchman, a brawn to complement the brains. What the main villain really needs is a powerful and dangerous right hand man, woman, or monster to go out and get the dirty work done quickly and efficiently. This is not that character. The villain's right hand burns down the peasant village to stop the prophecy only for the chosen one to escape. The right hand pursues the chosen one, dogging their every step, but somehow the heroes slip through their fingers every time. Their entire villainous career is nothing but one failure after another. Unfortunately for the right hand, the main villain always punishes failure. Fortunately, the main villain is never smart enough to actually replace their right hand minion with someone who actually knows what they're doing. Why make a cunning, smart, and dangerous opponent when I can instead fill the antagonist ranks with morons? Hmm. I wonder if this will be a theme with the rest of the bad guy entries. The Minions. The main villain has their right hand, but they also need an army of minions as well. These minions are a crack team of vicious and highly dangerous enemies that are... <laughs> just kidding. They're dumber than styrofoam and about as tough. What they lack in creating narrative tension, they make up for in disposability. The villain buys these goons in bulk and never considers using minions that might actually inspire terror in their enemies rather than witty quips and sarcastic banter as the good guys mow down the minions as casually as they take out the trash. Could the villain use the sheer weight of numbers of his evil minions to wear down the good guys with attrition and force them to actually get creative? 
Well, no, because much like the poor city guard, only one minion is allowed to attack the heroes at once. Besides, if we really want to threaten the heroes, then the main villain will deploy the elite minions. The elite minions are like normal minions. What, you thought there would be a difference? Well, the elite minions have a more fearsome reputation, hence why they are considered elite. Unfortunately for the forces of evil, this is simply a difference in branding rather than performance. They're still about as sturdy as paper mache in a hurricane. Could they at least act as a speed bump for the heroes? No, that role is reserved for the Guardian Beast. Every Dark Lord needs a terrible monster to guard their dungeon. Yes, surely the horrible beast will put a stop to the heroes after the right hand fell because he was too stupid, the minions fell because they were too stupid, and even the elite minions fell because they were too stupid. I'm sure a monster that is even dumber than all of the others combined will do the trick. The best part about the Guardian Beast is when it comes out of nowhere with zero foreshadowing and then is never mentioned again afterwards. Not only does it serve as a speed bump for the heroes, but it also serves as a pointless speed bump to slow down the story as well. Now a fantasy writer has enough off-the-shelf standard issue character archetypes to fill out the cast of their very own fantasy story. I mean, yeah, the reader will try to escape from a reality full of incompetent people, only to find themselves in a fantasy land full of idiotic characters, but hey, at least the snooty nobles don't all have blue check marks above their heads. At long last, we have the power to unmake the world. It will end in ash, fire, blood, death, and endless insanity. Simply lovely. Yeah, yeah, sometimes when I'm feeling down, I imagine being eaten by Cthulhu and having my soul digested in an eternity of deathless torment. That always cheers me up. But now it might be happening for real at long last. I'm so happy. We get such a better deal of those other pansy religions. Yes, the end is nigh. 2020 is our year. All thanks to Cthulhu. No, thanks to me, the Dark Lord. My search for the power of the sponsor is over. It is time for me to use its power to put it into all things and bring about ultimate destruction wrought by my own hands. Right after I take this video sponsor, Campfire Blaze, by force. Um, excuse me, pointy-helmeted sir, but you can't end the world. We call dibs. Calling this dibs person will not help you against me. Submit to my will and let the end begin. Well, that's very rude of you, sir. We worked hard to lay the foundations of the fall of humankind. For only through dedication, faith, goodwill, and empathy can we bring about the end of all things as the world as we know it slips into the inky abyss of screaming madness. Please, everyone knows the only thing you need to end the world is some odd collection of magical jewelry. Collect them all and it's instant fiery doom. Easy as making orphans. Well, that's very mean. Those orphans deserve a chance to be eaten by Cthulhu too. Here. We wrote this track to explain it. I don't have time for your pamphlets. But there's always time for pamphlets. I have an expanded universe to destroy. I shall use Campfire Blaze's burning power as a writing organizational tool. Power that can create entire universes with detailed timelines, character arcs, maps, location details, word processor, and research module, and twist that power for my own evil ends. I don't think that's how writing software works. Silence, mewling tentacled man. Campfire Blaze is modular, allowing you to build your own subscription, meaning I need only select the modules that I can weaponize, with some for as little as 50 cents a month. While you can collaborate real-time with other writers, I will keep Campfire Blaze's power all for myself. Well, actually, Campfire Blaze is in open beta for free for the entirety of this October. What? It's true. TWA fans, or anyone really, can go to bit.ly slash TWA Blaze or click in the link in the description below. You see, Mr. Dark Lord, 
the end of the world should be for everyone to enjoy, not just you.